Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to thank the organising committee for uh, accepting our abstract that we'd like to present to you today. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the two of us, myself and Kevin Sinclair, my co-author. So this, uh, this work was uh, undertaken, part funded by uh, the, the UK government. They're very good. They support uh, research, practice-based, industry-based research. Um, so this was led by ourselves at the Paragon Veterinary Group. We're a mixed uh, rural veterinary practice. Uh, and these are the partners that we work with over the period of the five years. And for those youngsters in the room, if you look at my grey hairs and, uh, and the age that I am, I've just completed my PhD, so there's hope for you all if somebody as old as me can do it. So I've, this is part of my PhD uh, study. So this is looking at the number of uh, bovine embryos produced worldwide. The top line in blue are what you would call conventional multiple ovulation embryo transfer uh, embryos as we would, the flushing of cows, that, the traditional way of doing it. The brown line below, going back to 1997, are in vitro produced embryos, so by the ovum pickup technique, so using ultrasound guided needle aspiration of the ovum, are then being fertilized in the laboratory. And you can see that in 2016, for the first time, the number of IVP produced embryos overtook uh, the number of conventionally in vivo produced embryos. And what's driving that globally? This is the same graph with the brown line at the top. You can see that it's largely been driven by two continents. The dark blue line that you can see uh, below, the br brown one, is uh, South America, and the light blue line is North America, Canada. So you can see that those two continents are driving uh, IVP, ovum pickup IVP, but on the bottom are the other continents, and, and sadly yellow is uh, Europe. So we're not really doing very much yet, but we're trying to get it going. So this project was all about establishing this in the UK, finding a system that worked in our conditions with our cattle. And this project, as I say, went back five or six years, and we went through uh, several iterations of equipment, uh, techniques, uh, media that we were using, different vacuums, uh, different techniques. Uh, you can see me there just to prove that I did do some of this work myself. Um, and ultimately looking to aspirate the follicles. You can see that ultrasound guide. Uh, that's ultrasound image there, so the black circles, as you know, are, uh, are follicles, and those are what we're trying to aspirate. Each one of those hopefully has a, a neocyte uh, within it, or a cumulus oocyte complex, as we would call it. Um, and a large part of what we're doing has been training, so training other veterinarians within the UK to develop a network of, uh, of opportunity. This is the lab, and again, within the laboratory, we've been looking at uh, different techniques. We actually have been doing some embryo biopsy. This is the embryo biopsy rig that we've got. Uh, and in the background, you can just see the, uh, the, on the screen there in that bottom picture, you can see the, uh, the biopsy being taken on the embryo. We did a lot of grading of the COCs, so the cumulus, cumulus oocyte complexes, I'll call them COCs. Uh, we did a lot of grading of them to actually find out whether the markers were there to help us predict the quality of the embryos, and ultimately we're trying to end up producing a, a healthy embryo. So this was the outcome of the project. The Innovate UK um, funding in the UK is all about developing uh, industry capability. So we now have this uh, network within the UK. So we have uh, um, three, three laboratories, uh, two of them effectively research laboratories, one at the University of Kent, one at the University of Nottingham, and ourselves at the practice in Penrith. And then we have six ovum pickup teams uh, based around the UK, and we have a further six transfer teams for actually transferring the embryos. So this was all part of the project for five years, and we were the first in the UK to market with, uh, with ovum pickup IVP. And one of the key parts of the, of the system that we've developed, which is what I'm really going to talk to you about today, is, is what we call stimulating and, stimulation and coasting protocols. So a lot of people who are doing ovum pickup, especially in Bos Indicus cattle, uh, don't stimulate the ovaries at all. They just will go in with the ultrasound and collect whatever oocytes they can. Unfortunately, that doesn't work very well uh, with Bos, uh, Bos Taurus cattle and certainly doesn't work very well in the UK. So what you have here is a cartoon of a normal uh, ovarian cycle, um, the follicular pole. Uh, you've got a dominant follicle uh, comes up. It obviously suppresses the other follicles and you get ovulation. And then what we do with a stimulated and coasted cycle, we use intravaginal um, progesterone rele releasing devices so that we control the progesterone. We go in with the, aspir the aspiration, we aspirate the dominant follicle, so you're removing that, uh, that suppressive effect of the dominant follicle. 
After a couple of days, you th we then used six uh, doses of FSH LH uh, in a relatively low dose, much lower than you would with conventional flushing, and then you coast, coast through 37 hours or so. We adjust it. But the idea is that you get a crop of follicles that are all the same size, they're all at the same stage of maturity. So when you aspirate those, you've got a, a cohort of follicles that are all effectively the same sort of size and competence of, um, of an, a normal ovulated follicle. These are the data sets. So you can see there was several ovum pickup teams in several laboratories over a period of time. And it's just to demonstrate that there was overall, we had 17, nearly 1,800 ovum pickup cycles. And one of the first things we realized is that there's quite a big operator difference. So along the top, we've got different ovum pickup operators, and you can see that open, uh, number two was picking up nearly 15 follicles every time he went in to aspirate, whereas ovum pickup five was only picking up six and a half. So there's definitely an, ovum, uh, an operator effect, but also the, the competence of what are being collected are also impacted. So you can see that ovum pickup uh, operator six was getting a bet better blastocyst rate per oocyte. So it was damaging the oocytes less, was getting a better COC complex. And then actually looking at the ovarian stimulation protocols themselves, we use two different uh, products. And these are not controlled studies. This is a, an observational study. This is a period of, uh, of several years that we were working. It's not, it's not um, a case controlled study, but it's a, it's a large amount of data. So we use two different products, Faltropin and Pluset. And what you're seeing here are the number of follicles that were actually aspirated. So these were the same ovum pickup operator teams and same technicians. So we're removing the confounders from there. But you can see that uh, using a stimulated cycle, we're collecting between 11 and 14 oocytes compared with, uh, but with nine, with a non-stimulated cycle. But what's probably just as important is that of those oocytes that were collected, only a certain good quality oocytes will then go on for insemination. And we can see here that with the stimulated cycles, we actually have a significantly greater number of, of, of oocytes are suitable for insemination. So not only are the uh, stimulated cycles producing more follicles, they're actually producing more competent oocytes at the same time. There was a difference in pregnancy rate. Now, this was early on. Uh, these, this pregnancy rate has improved a lot uh, now. This was sort of some, some early data with some problem breeding cows, and there was an indication that there may have been a slight uh, uh, difference in pregnancy rate, suggesting a different competence of um, um, embryos produced by the different systems, but that was not significant uh, statistically. So we then went on to look at what, what was causing the difference or whether we could identify the difference. And what we can see here is that with the stimulated cycles, we have a significantly uh, greater proportion of the COCs produced were grade ones and a significantly lower um, proportion of uh, COCs that were grade four. The grade twos and threes were not significantly different, but by using stimulation protocols, we were producing better quality COCs, and this is just a, uh, an observational um, system that we used looking down the microscope, but we were actually producing uh, better quality COCs by using the stimulation program. And ultimately, that looked like it was producing, uh, and it was significantly producing, um, a greater number of blastocysts per COC uh, collected. So again, you can see quite a massive difference here between 0.33 blastocysts or embryos per COC with the PLUSET program and only uh, 0.06 blastocysts per COC with a non-stimulated cycle. So those better quality COCs were producing more blastocysts. And then what we tried to do, or what we did do, was we, we produced a composite score, and this was really for our own interest to try and predict from any one cycle what the likely outcome was going to be. So basically what we did is we took a, a combination of the number of, of COCs produced and the quality of COCs, and we produced a very simple um, total mean uh, score. There's a formula at the top there. It's very simple, just taking the number, the quality multiplied by the number to give us a, a total mean score, which we then logged so that we could get a more linear um, graphical output. And you can see from these two graphs, the one on the left is blastocysts or, or embryos per COC um, versus the total mean score. 
and this, the one on the right is the, uh, the number of embryos per cycle versus the total mean score. And the blue lines are 95% confidence limits. So using this very simple COC score of, of number of, of, of COCs uh, and the quality of the COCs, we can predict reasonably accurately, although this is a log, uh, it's a log uh, squ uh, scale that, that I've um, back calculated to give you the bottom uh, axis, but uh, we can predict reasonably accurately the number of blastocysts we're likely to get um, from the, the quality and number of COCs. So what sort of conclusions did we develop after the, the, the time of our study? Operator skill, training and precise protocols are really important. In our, in our hands and in the UK, we really have to be very careful and be very, very precise. There are benefits in our hands to utilizing an FSH and coasting regime following uh, dominant follicle removal, and that's, uh, that's physical dominant follicle removal, not, not using um, uh, chemical uh, dominant follicle removal. By using different protocols or products, the, the, the results that we got definitely suggest that there's a different number and competence of blastocysts produced by each system. And we want to do more work on that, and we want to actually look at various FSH, LH protocols to see whether we can actually improve further uh, the, the, the competence of the blastocyst. Because fundamentally, in a commercial setup like ours, it's the number of live calves that are, that are born that are important. You can produce embryos. Uh, reasonably straightforwardly, but not all of those embryos will be competent and not all of them will go on to produce live calves. So it's really important that we produce blastocyst embryos that are as competent as possible. Where we are now, and, and with, the, with this same system has moved on, so we're now currently producing over four blastocysts per collection uh, on average, and that ranges uh, from zero, obviously, to 12 or 13, 14, uh, and we're running at one and a half pregnancies per ovum pickup cycle. So we can do that every two weeks. So we're, we're producing basically one and a half uh, pregnancies every two weeks from these animals. And we're regularly using sex semen uh, with these protocols as well. And there may be merit in, in developing this composite score a little bit further. It's useful for the farmer to know how many embryos he can expect the following week, it knows how many recipients to line up, for example. And it also helps us with adjusting our protocols because we can adjust the FSH program, we can adjust the actual coasting, uh, the length of time that these animals are being coasted for as well. So we can adjust that uh, and by being able to predict earlier on in the system what the outputs are likely to be, uh, that helps us. So as I say, although the PhD is now completed, uh, that we're continuing to collect data, we're still doing this on a commercial basis in the UK and there's further uh, work that we'd like to do looking at these coasting protocols. And we've just gone orange, so thank you very much, Mr Chairman.